Today we are deeply honored to be in the presence of a living legend. He is a celebrated author of over 140 books. His mission is global mental literacy. He is a professor and educator for adults and children. He's a top sportsman and he has the highest creative IQ in the world. He has reached over 2 billion people through media. He's an advisor to governments and businesses at the highest level. And amongst his achievements includes being nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for Education twice. But we know him as the famous Tony Buzan, the inventor of mind mapping, which has reached over 300 million people and changed many people's lives. I certainly am one of them. We are deeply honored and privileged to have the wonderful, the great Tony Buzan uh, with us today. And he graced us this evening anyway with uh, some of the other stuff that we were working on. But right now, we want him to talk about entrepreneurs. We want him to talk about jobs. We want him to inspire the 25, 30 million people who will be watching this particular video um, in terms of understanding how their life is working and how their brain is working. So uh, we have all of this to discuss that so we have today with us Professor Tony Buzan. Welcome. Good Lovely to see you, to be sir. Here. Wonderful to be here too with you. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Twenty-five million young people looking for jobs. What do you tell them in terms of how do they need to cope with this kind of desperation that there is in this world? Mm. Mm. Well, first of all, I would say, please don't be desperate. Don't be desperate. Because you, i.e. they, you, are equipped with the most powerful machine on the planet. And if you've got a machine and you don't know how to use it, you bury yourself. But if you know how to use it, you can build, you can create, you can do anything. And that is the brain. So quite simply, never get worried about it focus on improving this piece of super equipment. Going back to your childhood, what excited you? What inspired you to become what you are today? Hmm. <clears throat> nature inspired me. I loved nature and it worked. Uh, I studied insects and they were incredible thinking little machines, beetles were not robotic. They thought, they figured things out. So I became interested in thinking. I did not like school. I was bored. I didn't like taking all my notes. Um, I couldn't wait to get out of school. And I began to realize that the reason why I didn't like school is that I was not being taught how to think. And if I wasn't taught how to think, then I couldn't think. And if I had problems, problems everywhere, and I, I thought, mm, more problems, more problems, and I began to realize that that was not the way the world is. And worrying about things, waste of time. Because the brain, I began to realize, can actually find solutions. <clears throat> Another important thought around the world is we are problem solvers. The brain, the brain is a problem solver. And that is true, but it's not really true. Because the brain is a solution finder. So, I mean, all of you kids out there, think about it. If you just say to yourself, I am a problem solver, or I am a solution finder. What would you rather be? I would be a solution finder. Obviously. <laughs> yes. So that's what your brain is. And therefore, if you think, I'm a solution finder, and what solution do you want? I want a job. And your brain's a solution finder. So you will find a job. Were you rebellious as a child? And what was the catalyst 
for you to become delinquent, <clears> if you were? <laughs> <laughs> I was rebellious. Okay. Um, when I had to take note after note after note, and I began to realize that it was really boring, I began to think, you know, hold on a minute, why am I stuck in this classroom having to use one color of ink? And I had to, and if I didn't, I got punished. Uh, and my best friend, who, like me, loved nature, and he could identify by flight patterns every living thing, and he could bang, 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 name them. But in school he was called stupid, because he couldn't write, you know, he was illiterate, he came from a very poor family, um, but he was a genius. And I knew that he was. And so in the school, I was called smart because I knew some things about nature. But I knew that he knew much more than I did. And he was called dumb, dull, dullard, dimwit. And he wasn't. And that's when I became very rebellious. You know, Who has the right to say that boy, that girl is stupid? Who has the right? And I began to realize nobody has the right. So again, any of you who think you're stupid, that's not true. You're really bright. Your brain is astonishing. And all you've got to do is develop it. You know, each, each student has a resource. Yes. And what resource do they have? Hands, yeah. mouth. All of that is run by this. So the most, most important thing to manage <clears throat> is the manager of whatever you've learned. And the manager of that is the brain. So again, in a sense, you out there, you simply need an operations manual for your brain. Because if you buy you know, a little radio, you get an operations manual. You buy, you go to the chemist and you get a package of aspirins. You get an instruction sheet. So this, and there are only 25 million? Mm -hmm. Is that all? <laughs> only 25 million? How many jobs are there that are needed? Yeah. I mean, think of every job that is needed. There's labor. And when you labor, and I did that when I was going to go to university, <clears throat> I, well actually, I'll jump ahead. When I was graduating from university, I went to the employment area, and I said, you know, me, <laughs> I've done sport, I want a good job, I write well, and so I want a good job. And they went through the file, and he said, oh, you've got a good job here, farming. Mm -hmm. And I said, ah, I'm going to be managing a farm. <clears throat> but the lady said, um, it's a job removing manure. <laughs> and I said, are you saying that you're offering me a job of shoveling shit? Yeah. And she said, you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, how much does it pay? And she said, that's the problem with you students. All you're interested in is the money. And I thought, OK, you know, thanks God you're telling me that my university, my school career has actually not done what I had needed to be done. So I took the job. And I shoveled. And the chickens shat. And I shoveled. <laughs> And at the end of a day, I put it on the truck, on the lorry, and I took it into the woods, and I shoveled that off. And there was a pile of manure, and I'd done it. Three months. Every day, I did not have to take linear, boring notes. I could look at nature. I was getting really strong. And I could think. And I began to realize that 
some of the best jobs available are labor, you know, working physically, because then I can think and work on things. And when I'm doing labor jobs, I also carried out garbage. People say, oh, you know, garbage man, well, you know, what's the matter with you? Yeah. I said, you know, look, boom, you, bam. You became strong, you became, you get air, you... Get air, yeah. could help people. Yeah. Um, it's amazing because I think uh, we get stuck at universities and fancy schools and so on, and we create this little paradigm in our minds in terms of what our job should look like. And that's probably one of the things that holds us back. It's not one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the thing that holds us back. You know, we think, I don't have a degree, I didn't do well in school, um, there are no jobs. No jobs? Yeah. I mean, look around. Yeah. And everybody needs help. And most kids, even though they're kind of trying to be tough and actually do care and they care for people and there are many people who are ill or who have a damaged limb or they're in a wheelchair in airports for example it was just considered to be a low-level job you know pushing wheelchairs but imagine having a job where you're wheelchairing people who are say 60 70 80 mm -hmm who've broken a leg or they've got arthritis and you're running like 13 miles a day <laughs> with a wheelchair helping somebody and you meet people who are really interesting what a job yeah. what a wonderful job so everybody out there has to think what is a job a job is simply an employment that employs your energy it employs your body, it employs your brain. So use your brain, use your body, and wherever you can find a job, do one. Because then you think, well, I've, I've done wheelchairing. I could also be a waiter or waitress in a restaurant. Or, you know, I, I could be a nurse. And that wouldn't take long, because I could become the beginning of nursing. I could become a driver. I could work in a factory. Would that be interesting? Yes, it would. Jobs versus entrepreneurship, because I think a lot of people believe that they have a God-given right to get a job. But if they're resourceful, they can be entrepreneurs. After all, in the good old days, uh, there was a farmer, there was a carpenter, there was a fisherman. They were all entrepreneurs because they used to go and do something, create something, sell something, and have an exchange. Why is everybody feeling so entitled that they but just because they've gone to university, they must have a job. Mm -hmm. It's because we've been trained that way. You know, we've been trained, you must do this kind of studying, you must take these kind of notes, you must get this certificate, and if you got that certificate, then you are entitled. And that's not really true, and it's also not fair. Yeah. Because if you've done the wrong thing. Like if you've been studying and you've studied in the wrong way and you've, you've got a, an MBA, a Master of Business Administration, and you have learnt short-term thinking, only using part of your left cortical skills, if you think of money, logic, rationale, and you get a degree. <laughs> Where's your imagination? Where's your human intelligence? Where's your social intelligence? Not there. And you're stuck in a digital age. So the truth is that if you've got a degree and you don't think, and you've been trained not to think, you won't get a job. And that's fine, because when you haven't got a job, you'll have to think, you know, <laughs> hold on a minute. Um, there's a common, a common saying in many cultures, necessity is the mother of invention. In other words, when you're stuck, <laughs> you've got to find a way out. Yeah. 
And the wonderful news there is that the brain, being a solution finder, can always, and the word is always, find the way out. So if you just sit and say, I've got a degree and therefore I should get employment. Bad thinking. Because if you think like that, who's going to want to employ you? Mm -hmm. you, know, you can imagine. Imagine you've got a, a university graduate and they've got a degree just in logic and analysis and money and economics. And they don't smile. They're not healthy. They're not geometrically capable. They don't play games. They're not fun. <clears throat> They're rigid. They're stuck into a computer rather than getting stuck into this biocomputer. Would you want them in your company? <laughs> Would you want them? Is that the advice you give to uh, employers and, and uh you know, you advise a lot of boards and, and, and governments. Is that the advice you give them, is to get more imagination rather than more rigid thinking? Absolutely. Every company, every company has to be creative. It has to be innovative. It has to think. Because business is competition, isn't it? What is interesting now, and it's good for you to know that we are now entering no longer the information age. So you're not getting into the information age. And you're not getting into the knowledge age. You're getting into the intelligence age. And that's where we learn how to think and how to develop all your multiple intelligences. And you can do that on your own. You know, the world is a university. Which brings me to another question in terms of parents. Um, and, and the current education system, how do you train an eight-year-old for a job 15, 20 years for looking forward with the current education system? Isn't there this, this chasm that these kids are going to fall <laughs> into because they're just not going to be able to get there and they're being trained for jobs that don't exist in the future? Yeah. So we are in a massive dilemma. <laughs> I mean, the, the average student now is kind of jumping that hurdle. By the time you've jumped that hurdle, you've got to be over there, mm -hmm. not over here. Right. And you jump this little hurdle, jump this little hurdle, and the future's out there. Yeah. So there's only mm -hmm. one big thing that all of you have to learn. You've got to learn how to learn. You've got to develop your multiple intelligences and you've got to learn how to think, you've got to learn how to remember, you've got to learn how to read, read is a big one, you've got to learn how to study, you've got to learn how to communicate, you've got to get your brain and body together and <clears throat> you must have a goal, a goal. Every person who's ever succeeded had a vision, a dream. So if you're a daydreamer, so much the better. And I know you are anyway. <laughs> so daydream what you want. And don't just daydream and say, yeah, it'd be really great to have a good job. Or it'd be really nice to make a million dollars, pounds, yens, riyadh, whatever. You just think, what I would like to be is that. And therefore, I will work to get that real. So you work to make it come true. And therefore, every child has to be taught by every parent, every school, learn how to think, learn how to use your brain. And when you can do that, you will be fine. It's the most powerful equipment, the most powerful machine on the planet and maybe even in the universe. Do em employers actually realize that? Because when they look at a CV, they're looking at the qualifications and numbers of years here and so on. What advice do you have for employers when they look at a CV or, or they're starting to evaluate to hire somebody? <clears throat> employers who only look at the CV and say, oh, must be good, has a degree in that. I would advise them <clears throat> to
to change your job. <laughs> <laughs> because you're doing the wrong thing. Because to get a good company, you have to find good brains. And all the brains are good. As soon as you know how to learn, everything is ignited. I mean, and again, check your friends. Watch your friends doing what they really love, whatever it happens to be. And they're always good, aren't they? Always. So approach things like that. And when, when employers are trying to find good candidates, basically, they're all there anyway. And all they have to do is train them. And they've got to train them how to mind map, how to think from different angles, to be creative, uh, to draw. Doodling is actually a high sign of intelligence. Um, you've got to have more fun, because when you have fun, as long as it's good fun, your brain grows, yeah. your creativity grows. One of the challenges we find that uh, boards and chairmen are in their 60s, and the managers are in their 40s, and the consumers are in their 20s. So there's this intergenerational play that's going on between this group. Um, so the decision-making process is quite tenuous and quite distant. What advice would you give to the board and, and the chairman of companies in terms of how they should look at the whole resource space of employment, uh, of energizing their teams, because now the formula is changing, or has already changed. All the great leaders in business, in military, in science, all the great leaders remained as a child. So if the board is filled with people over 60 to 70 to 80, and people say, oh, that's terrible. They're going to be old fuddy daddies. And <laughs> not true. If they are 60 and they are bored and boring, then they need to train themselves. Because the great leaders are cross generational. And a great leader will go and talk to three year old children and play with them. And the little children, wow. 30-year-old, 40-year-old, the same. So <clears throat> these dividing into generations, not really essential. If people are trained to be rigid, and they are successfully rigid, then they are. But that's not old. That's a human brain that has been trained for 60 years to be rigid, and it's very good at being rigid. Mm. I mean, when I was, for example, <clears throat> at school and in university, I, was, I thought in the beginning, I will take good notes and I will be smart and I will get good marks. I began to realize when I went to the university that I was beginning to fail. And the more I did what I thought I should do, the worse my marks went down. And I began to think, I'm not smart. I, uh, I'm not as smart as I thought I would be. However, the fact was that for 18 years, I trained myself to be really good at being stupid. <laughs> yes. And I was good at it. And in companies, when you've got people who really train themselves well to be stupid, and rigid and boring and out of touch, they're really good at it. But those who continue to train themselves to learn and think and be creative, they are fabulous. And <clears throat> in every society throughout history, who do the people want? They want the great older people because the good older ones are strong, their minds are filled with more and more knowledge and experience. They've failed and failed and failed. And when they're on the floor, they get up again. <laughs> so they learn how to fail. They learn how to handle mistakes. Um, so I think that the world is 
on the verge now, a cusp in entering the intelligence age, it's going to be a lot better place. So from what I'm hearing uh, is that if older people have wisdom and the younger people have the, the, the yearning for knowledge, and if we can find a good way to bring them together, the 70-year-old person who has just retired will feel much more empowered and the young person will be, have much more wisdom. Is that a new social contract that we should start building? And for those who are wise, absolutely. For those who are not, not that contract. <laughs> so, I mean, basically, the society now has to change. The tectonic plates have to change. The children have to be taught always to remain like a child, to be imaginative, to use your daydreaming capacity, make those come true, to use colors, to use logic, to use analysis. <clears throat> and as long as that is done, then the child, by the time they are 18, is still imaginative. Not like I was, right. rigid, linear, pretty boring, and I was. So the contract has to be made now to value the human brain, value the intelligence, nurture it, harvest it, guide it. And all of you have got these things in your head. So you're going to be in a fine situation. We are in the middle of the Future Foundation. We're in the middle of the Dubai Futures Accelerator, which is building the future. And we see a plethora of technology and, and, and infrastructure here. A lot of this is, is creating a new world where technology is going to take over 90% plus of the mechanical work of the brain. So therefore, there will be even fewer jobs for mechanical work. So the 5 to 10% of your brain that's left now needs to be 95% of our activity, which is imagination, <laughs> yeah. intuition, uh, love, affection, uh, you know, inner, inner emotions, all of those things become primary as opposed to what the computer can do for us now, the cognitive computers and so on. In this new world of imagination and art and culture and, and it's just new flavors that we are getting, what advice do you give to people who are evolving over the next, say, 25 years? Simple advice. <clears throat> Explore it, enjoy it, because the world is now in a new renaissance. And a renaissance is what? It's the rebirth. Yeah. And this is now the rebirth of the intelligence, the creativity, the love, the, again, the multiple intelligences. Yeah. That's what it's like. And in those days, in Japan, in China, in Australian Aboriginal society, in India, in Mesopotamia, the Gulf, in Italy, the Renaissances were. Mm -hmm. And what were they all based on? They were based on art, on poetry, on philosophy, on wealth and how to generate it, on spirituality, on caring, on finding solutions for every situation in which the society came. And we are now in that new age, but it's the first time in history that all the cultures can now contact with all the other cultures. And we are suddenly finding out this amazing piece of new information. We're actually humans, and humans operate on the same principles. We speak the same language, imagination, association, connectivity. We speak with our bodies. We communicate with our bodies, with our eyes, with our thoughts, with our mouths, with our dance, with our paintings, with our poetry. So that's where all the cultures have always dreamt 
of becoming. And we're now at the verge of being able to do that. And the technology, which has given information overload, which has caused a lot of stress, now, when we're in the intelligence age, we can think intelligently about industry, think intelligently about technology, think intelligently about knowledge, think intelligently about intelligence. And that's where we are. And it's getting really exciting. So in answer to your question, what should you do? Enjoy it. <laughs> what better state can you be in? You know, the growth of the evolution of the human race. We would like to be here for your 100th birthday on the 2nd of June, 2042. What new stories will we be celebrating when we come back to your birthday in a place like mm. this? What are the new stories that, that, that are being written at this moment in your life? Mm. My 100th birthday, 1942, the born, 2042, the birthday. I will definitely see millions upon millions of mind maps because all the students will now have mind mapping as just the, the normal way of taking Maybe notes. we'll have a mind map chip that we put in everybody's brain when they're born. How's that? I don't think so. <laughs> okay. I don't think That's so. That's um, <clears throat> The brain itself is much more powerful than people think it is. It does astonishing things. I will um, definitely have seen by that time other life in the universe. I hope that I would have gone to the moon. I would love to go to the moon. I know that by then space travel will begin to become you know, a popular thing. Um, <clears throat> I know that in astronomy, we will find out more and more about where we are. Um, our telescopes now can see to the end of the universe. <clears throat> All that light that comes in, when you look at the stars, that's actually trillions upon trillions of stories. It's stories. So when you see that star and you think, oh, twinkle, twinkle, little star, that light has traveled from that star like three billion years ago, mm -hmm. which means that that light beam is saying, hi, Tony, you know, I was, well, I am in that light beam, a giant star. And that light beam contains all the information of all the, the chemical and the equations, the, the elements, all there. And it tells me how long. And maybe that star is no longer there. And everywhere you look, story after story after story. So by the time I'm 100, we will have billions upon billions of stories from the universe that have been told to us. Uh, by the time I'm 100, I will have, inshallah, <laughs> finished another 100 books. Okay. I've written 142 today. Um, <clears throat> one of the books that I know I will cherish is a book about animals and their intelligence. Um, by 2042, we will know that all those creatures we call dumb beasts are brilliant. They are brilliant, and we will know that, and we'll be able to communicate with them a lot more. I know that my big fairy story, and a novel, big novel for children, <clears throat> in the area of uh, The Little Prince or Alice in Wonderland, that kind of category, that will have been a movie there will be characters that have been in my mind for 40 years that will be out there boom, 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 walking around. I think that medicine will now have accelerated, combining all the different cultures' medicines. And we will be incredibly fit and strong. 
I think that by the time I'm 100, I'll probably be 125. <laughs> because medicine is going so yes. fast yes. that if I make it to 100, anybody who's 100 will probably make it to 125. Right. If I make it to 125, by that time medicine will have got people to 125, they'll be 200. So maybe I'll be 200. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Professor Bazan, real pleasure. Thank you very much. A indeed. delight. And A delight. Thank you very much indeed.